everyone to the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network or WeCan session. My name is Osprey Oreo Lake and I'm the Executive Director of WeCan and I'm really honored to be here with some really amazing women and they're all going to introduce themselves in turn. In this quite epic moment, we need to address that the dual crises of the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis are both rooted in the dominant culture's disconnection and disrespect for nature and each other. And also how these crises are exposing and amplifying global systems of exploitation, capitalism, racism, colonization, and that these systems of uh, oppression, they're all connected. And at this time, we can also see how they are disproportionately harming indigenous people, communities of color, women, and also the land. And I say this because I don't think we're going to move forward without really attending to the root causes of these injustices. We need our governments right now and our societies to fundamentally transform in order to truly care for people and planet. And for this, we need a, really a variety of solutions that are appropriate to place people, culture, and the landscape. And this is an approach that many of us have been envisioning and working in our movements for intersectionality. Um, and yes, we need a scope, a large scope of agendas, and possibly the Green New Deal, if we really fight for it in a good way, could be one of those uh, platforms. But it really needs to be an agenda where workers' rights, indigenous rights, gender rights, racial, economic, and environmental justice are centered and so much more. And at WeCan, we're really calling for deep systemic change because this is what this almost unimaginable moment is really calling for. We're also working with women leaders around the world um, and in different regions, we see how women have um, incredibly in ingenious solutions to what's going on right now. And they're engaging in diverse solutions that are quite successful. And I say this because, you know, the real problem right now is not that we don't have solutions, but rather the violent and outrageous structural interference that those in power are exercising in response to the actions that people are taking right now, such as the fossil fuel industry, which is a really big one, but there are others, and the financial institutions and governments that are enabling the fossil fuel industry to continue to pollute while reaping massive profits and doing so with impunity. Let's be really crystal clear that there's no way we're going to succeed in averting the climate catastrophe without first stopping fossil fuel expansion and the financing of it. Um, we need to also see that you know, these pandemics are going to continue, as scientists tell us, as the climate crisis unfolds. So we're really calling on banks to immediately divest from the fossil fuel industry. We're also calling on governments to stop current bailouts to the oil and gas sector, when instead we need to be investing in people and planet, not these polluting industries. Also, I think this is really an amazing time to radically imagine a world that is healthy and just and invest in that vision. As stability in the current systems falters and cracks as it is right now, this is actually a time where new ways of visioning and being can have a considerable impact. Even ideas and policies that were seen to be in quotes too radical before actually have a chance right now. This is a vital time to draw upon the knowledge and leadership of frontline communities who've already been engaging in these solutions for a really long time and within this context, one of our highest priorities is to lift up indigenous leadership and learning from their incredible relationship with their lands and traditional ecological knowledge. Additionally, some of the most important voices that we are lifting up right now is that of women and feminist leaders. Due to gender inequality around the world, women are in fact um, experiencing climate chaos and environmental degradation first and worse because of this inequality. Yet at the same time, we know from many global studies, women are essential to solutions and we can't actually get to sustainability without women. 
And I'd like to also note that even now, as we see the COVID-19 pandemic unfolding, countries that are led by women are responding far better and having far better success. So women's leadership is essential and especially centering the leadership of indigenous women and women of color. This is how we're gonna to get to where we need to go and how we're gonna win. In closing, I would just say that the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis are clearly turning our world completely upside down. And yet we have the chance right now to not go back to where we were because where we were was not working. This is our moment to call forth a just and healthy world. And we really look forward to working with all of you collectively for this promising future. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rupa Maria. I'm a physician in San Francisco, California at the University of California. Um, and I'm a professor of medicine where I've been um, involved in the response to COVID-19 here in San Francisco. Um, COVID-19, this pandemic is exposing our vulnerabilities embedded in the systems created by colonialism. These same systems are the same systems that have pushed us to where we are here at this moment with climate change. Um, these fracture lines that have been exposed um, right now by COVID-19 are exactly how we've been divided and conquered through systems of colonialism. Um, divided and conquered from each other, divided and conquered from indigenous people, divided and conquered from our relationship to other animals and other beings like the water, divided and conquered from the earth. And it is these divisions that are creating such great suffering um, in the world and will create more suffering until we re realign ourselves properly. Um, and that realignment is a call to decolonize. I wanted to share um, a slide which explains this, which demonstrates this um, better than I can. Here we go. So as we see here, um, this system of colonialism has been um, really created these, these structures of supremacy um, that Osprey was just talking about, um, white supremacy, male supremacy, um, human supremacy, and even religious supremacy supremacy such as Christian or Hindu supremacy which we're seeing right now um, in in different nations um, but these all of these systems of supremacy where we have lost our way in understanding how our relationships to each other are crucial relationships of equity are crucial all of these dysfunctional relationships of supremacy lead in the end to trauma and as an outcome inflammation and what we're seeing right now in our diseases, um, even in the expression of how COVID um, manifests in the body is profound and overwhelming inflammation. We're seeing inflammation of our planet with rising temperatures and forest fires. Um, we're seeing inflammation in our bodies. We're seeing inflammation in our societies as our um, relationships to each other um, fracture. So what I'm um, calling on right now is a a, a really a, a chance to to decolonize to create a system a global system of care that supplants the systems of supremacy that we have been living under for the last several hundred years um, a global system of care where we realign ourselves in proper relationship to indigenous people where we give them the honor and respect that they deserve for stewarding the world's biodiversity at the levels that they do we need to lead by following their example there is no other way that we are going to be able to arrive in a healthy balance um, in ourselves or in our communities or on our planet without doing that and what we've seen so excitingly in this time of real stress as a, a frontline provider is that this system doesn't care if you're a doctor or a nurse it doesn't care if you're a janitor it doesn't care what what color you are we have physicians at my hospital who, who don't have don't feel supported wearing the um, protection they feel necessary to take care of these um, people without getting infected. We're seeing doctors and nurses dying around the world because they don't have adequate care. Um, they don't have adequate protection. We're seeing nurses in trash bags. Um, we're seeing this just dis blatant disregard of, of human life and no one is, is safe from that. And so 
I, I ask that we consider on May 1st a global general strike until we get what we want, until we get a just transition, until we get a plan for a Green New Deal all over the world that's led by indigenous people and their wisdom, until we get medical care for all in, in systems like we have here in the United States, which has for too long financially oppressed the people um, with, the, with the idea of healthcare, which, which is false. More people who have, um, who go into medical bankruptcy in the United States, about 60% of them have private health insurance. It is a farce. We no longer need to be putting our resources into these industries and corporations that leave the people out and the workers who, who create the engine of our society out of the picture. So what we've seen in the last few weeks is that our collective power, when we withhold our work, the stock market falls. We, we see this, it, it threatens people in power. Um, how can we create new economies together? How can we shore up our food and medicine, the primacy of our food and medicine and shelter in our own communi communities? How can we decolonize power structures and relationships to work together as um, workers around the world and people and communities um, who need to be uplifted? How do we find new ways of relating to each other that can dismantle those structures that have really um, forced us in, in improper relationship that's driving inflammation? So I'm calling on everyone to consider a general strike around the world to withhold our work until we have our demands met. And I'm calling on us all to imagine a culture of care being the culture that is the dominant culture from here on out. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak with all of you wonderful women. So, hello. My name is Jackie Patterson. I am the Senior Director of the Environmental and Climate Justice Program at the NAACP. And so, as we all know, the, <clears throat> and as Rupa shared and, and Osprey as well, the, the same systemic inequities that make certain populations differentially vulnerable to various impacts from COVID-19 are the systemic underpinnings that comprise the root causes driving environmental injustice and climate change. Whether it's racism, xenophobia, sexism, they all combine with poverty, housing, insecurity, racial profiling, uh, differential access to health care, under-resourced education, privatized criminal justice systems, and disproportionate exposure to the pollution that attacks the lungs, rendering different communities even more vulnerable to COVID-19 that also targets the lungs. These are all co critical commonalities that are shared by COVID-19 and climate change. Then we have the government responses that prioritize protecting the profits of big corporations while comparatively neglecting Thing to advance a response at the scale and depth that truly upholds the well-being of people. As we talked about in the NAACP fossil fueled foolery report, the tie between corporate interests and our policymakers and policies are far too enmeshed. All of this combines to ensure that Black, Indigenous, and other communities are facing the harshest fallout of the direct impacts of COVID-19, just as we in the environmental and climate justice community saw with Hurricane Katrina, the BP oil drilling disaster, and beyond. In each and every one of these disasters, including the COVID-19 pandemic, women face violence in the aftermath and also are more likely to suffer long-term displacement. In each of these circumstances, it was Black women, Latina women, Indigenous women, migrant women who experienced double jeopardy as both race and gender proved to be liabilities in this capitalist economy. Time and time again, we've seen how structural inequities lead to inequities in health and well-being. If we're not careful to the extent that there are people-focused responses, as we've also seen in the past, responses lacking new nuances can actually deepen the inequities for some. Not only will these efforts fail to meet the FEMA standard of making households whole post-disaster, but recovery efforts can actually set people back to a condition worse than their pre-pandemic baseline. For example, when defining essential services without an equity analysis, the determination always begs the question of essential for whom. So blanket policies to shut down services mean that fragile families with young children don't have access to social services, that women don't have access to reproductive health, health services or shelter from domestic violence. People aren't being treated for chronic illnesses that leave them most vulnerable to fatality from COVID-19, conditions that are disproportionately prevalent in our communities. And then there are the stories upon stories of pe people seeking health care and being turned away to provide self-care at home. And all too many of these stories 
stories are familiar because they, they have seen fatal effects and we remember the histories of African-American women being more likely to die of breast cancer due to undertreatment, African-Americans being more likely to have amputations than treatment and so much more. When I first drafted the 10 equity implications of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, when people first looked at it, their reaction was, wow, that's a lot of information. Can we kind of sum it up somehow? My response was, yes, we can put it all in buckets, subcategories, sub-bullets. But when people begin to summarize, the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable, marginalized populations are the ones who fall through the cracks, just as they do in a system that's predicated on a philosophy and a set of policies and practices that favor the survival of the fittest. So each mar marginalization factor, whether it's gender, race and ethnicity, immigration status, incarceration, LGBTQ orientation, age, geography, disability, or poverty or more, each factor stands at a, as a risk on its own. And by definition, many compound on top of each other, causing double and triple jeopardy for individuals, families, and communities. And as such, the response systems must be led by groups who represent constituencies on the front lines of response and on the front lines of impact. We've already seen the blame the victim narratives pointing to the high rates of obes obesity, diabetes, hypertension in black communities. And all of that is true. Way before the racialized pattern of mortality came to light, we listed these risk factors in our report, which we put out on March 13th, where we forecasted what was to come. But also as true is the historic underpinnings from diets based on survival and slavery, as we had to survive on the scraps from the meat not served on a master's table. Family units were intentionally broken in the context of our enslavement then modern day redlining leads to under-resourced infrastructure and lack of resources in our communities, lack of choices in our communities, with the domination of policies by big agriculture and domination of our markets with foods that are high in sodium, sugar, and preservatives. Then the war on drugs, which made our streets less, less, less safe. The lack of green spaces has made us less likely to get exercise. And the conspiracies such as the Tuskegee experiment and other systematized slaughter of our people has made us less trusting of the guidance coming from a state-sponsored podium, even when language is used such as big mama and pop pop. Well, to pivot on a, on a positive note to solutions, the good news is that the communities are organizing ourselves with women in the forefront. Frontline communities are rising up and putting together platforms of demand at the federal, state, and local levels. We're implementing changes on the front line at the same time and forging new link linkages and organizing um, government entities um, from nonprofit to nonprofit, community to community, family to family, person to person. Together through mutual aid and other efforts, women are on the front lines of feeding those who hunger now while setting up locally controlled sustainable food systems. Women are leading on restoring our relationship with the land. Women are providing sanctuary to those in need of a home while establishing land security efforts so that people don't find themselves vulnerable to being evicted by heartless landlords. Women are pushing back on the water shutoffs while establishing water sovereignty models. We're, confront, we're comforting those who are mourning while pushing for the policies and practices we need to establish a regenerative caring economy that advances health care for all, but it frees the imprisoned and provides income for people whose livelihoods are in jeopardy jeopardy and provides protection for those who are on the front lines. So thank you. I look forward to working with you to, to continue to build up these efforts. Take care. Hello, uh, my name is Monique Varda and I'm really honored to be in such incredible company um, with such powerful women and it's really inspiring to know that um, yeah, um, this work is being done in spite of uh, what feels like a complete timeout <laughs> in the world right now in the chaos of COVID. Um, I am living on the banks of the lower Mississippi River Delta um, in a place that uh, the Choctaw called Bulbuncha, meaning place where many languages or many tongues are spoken. Um, you know, the colonizers are really great at rebranding it in New Orleans. Um, and uh, my Homa relatives, as well as uh, my relatives who were the colonizers, have been living here for hundreds of years. Um, and in recent years, we have recognized that we are in the red zone. This is a place that is losing land at one of the fastest rates on the planet. 
Um, I say that I live just north of the dead zone where runoff coming from the Mississippi River, uh, you know, the Mississippi River is draining 41% of the United States. Um, and this fertilizer runoff creates these algal blooms every summer, um, the size of New Jersey and growing every year. Um, and just south or really, um, I feel like I'm in the heart of Cancer Alley, to be really honest. Um, there are over 150 petrochemical plants um, that are from New Orleans to Baton Rouge, which is about 120 miles, river miles. Um, and we know that this is also the red zone where um, the uh, mortality rates of COVID are much higher <laughs> because the air is, uh, is not clean. Um, and also this legacy of where plantations once sat, we have these petrochemical plants sitting in this um, perpetuation of, of this corporate colonial mentality of, and multinational corporations that are getting very rich in a place um, that is providing a, a portal, an entry, and an exit point for the nation's energy supply. Um, and, and also we're at the bottom of the barrel when it comes, you know, to like healthcare and education in the United States. Um, so these inequities are, are very much so in our face. And with each disaster, um, right, like we are memorializing the 10 year anniversary of the BP drilling disaster, which happened on 420, 2010. Um, and to recognize that we are we are no safer now really than we were then and that um, as we're facing this crisis of COVID and people's lives being on the line, there are also these rollbacks that are happening environmentally um, and what that means. So, you know, uh, in, in, in my kind of what is the what is the highlight in the darkness, you know, they're really I feel like I've been seeing women kind of I've been thinking of them as like rising up out of the mud here, out of the dirt, and really putting their hands in the dirt and recognizing um, the plant medicine and the, the medicine that is found within our community and the strength that is within our community and recognizing that, um, you know, we're living in these modern times, but there are the old ways that can help us um, to, to move forward and also recognizing that um, it is the land and it is the waters here in the in the delta for us that feed us um, and the waters everywhere that are so important to provide um, to provide for everything right clean water is the most important thing um, so as we're kind of recognizing and reprioritizing our our world I think this is um, really an opportunity to to you know what put what is up there what's most important um clean water community a safe place to live and a place to grow our gardens and to share with our children is so important um so yeah um yeah in the darkness i feel like there is the light and i've been so grateful for the garden and to know that um that there are women out there tending their gardens in different ways all over the world thank you it's good to be with all of you uh, my name is Casey Camp Hornick. I'm a member of the Ponca Nation of Oklahoma. I'm a matriarch of a very large clan drumkeeper for our women's society and a proud mama, grandma, auntie, sister, niece, daughter, granddaughter, survivor, and also a future ancestor. Coming to you today with the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network has been a, a very powerful thing. Listening to the women who have talked before me gave me a great depth of understanding and, and a very deep uh, feeling of gratitude that there are women who really are understanding where we are in this moment and how we're going to go forward at the same time. Because going forward is something that we all have to recognize is part of the lesson that we're learning now. I find myself understanding why my people never had a word for time, uh, a clock, or anything like that. Because it's all very fluid in this moment that we're living in. I see people forgetting to notice 
what time it is, what day it is, but instead noticing what is real and, and what is viable in the way that we're going to be going forward. Is the sun shining today? Did the Father Son rise and give us this day? Is the water flowing in a clear and good way? I live with a, a creek around me and I hear her singing all the time. And she talks about the things that need to be taken care of in this period of time. Are the deer and the fish living in a healthy way? Is the air, the Father's sky, being very strong? And the fact is that as we are in this moment where we're sitting at home, as we're supposed to do on a regular basis, learning from our children, being part of the natural law that's living all around us, whether there's a, a little virus going through humans or not, the birds are singing, the fish are swimming, the earth is purifying herself in a powerful way, the skies are clearing up, and it's teaching us that our mother, the earth, our father, the sky, is going to be very quick in its healing, whether humans participate or don't participate is something that we have to learn. What is our new participation going to be? It has to be in the manner in which it used to be. So when we talk about a Green New Deal, that really is a very old, old deal that humans entered into with all different forms of life because of, uh, we've said it so many times. We are not protecting nature. We are nature protecting itself. And we have to all come to that understanding in the very deepest part of us. I woke up at 3.30 a few nights ago to look at the moon as she had three stars, uh, Mercury and Jupiter and Saturn trailing off the crescent of her. And what I understood at that time is that I need to fast on Earth Day. And that every day is Earth Day to us. And, and if we need to choose a day for all of us to come together, April 22nd is all right. I like it okay. But I looked around and I thought of all of those without food. I saw a woman who stood in line in the New Orleans area in her car, actually, not standing. But she waited 18 hours for food from a food bank because that's what was available for her. And she did that. So I'm going along with the idea of a strike on May 1st. I think it's a beautiful idea. But I would also encourage us to begin a fast. Earth Day is a good day for me to begin that fast. And I'm taking vows for a four-day fast. In order for there to be food for others, that's the way we have been taught. That's how we sacrifice during our sacred moments at our Sundance. And I'm going to ask you all, if health permits, for you to fast as well. Let this be a rolling fast where we each choose a time and we allow ourselves, our bodies, to understand what hunger is, to understand even what thirst is in a very good way and to go without food so others may have. The way we were taught is that our children would always eat if we sometimes fasted. And so I will be doing a four-day fast from Earth Day for the next four days. And that happens to be a new moon as well. We're re-experiencing also matriarchy, although maybe that other society doesn't understand it. When we're spending our time at home and we're teaching our children the true values of what is going to be their future, then we're spending the time in the way that we should have always done. And we're teaching them about what the, has been a system of uh, looking at things as resources when in fact we should be taking that re off of there. These are sources of life that we're talking about, the sacred water, the sacred air, the sacred plant life. The sacred animals, all of those things are part of a, a system of life that has been in place since humans have been in place. Gardening is an old, wonderful way that we all lived before. 
And I think that we need to understand that water itself is within our human body as well as the body of all. And that we need to talk to that water and thank the water, not as an external force, as so many of us do, when we can just go to a faucet and turn it on, but as an internal blessing that connects all life everywhere. And that we should, uh, I was I was actually understanding when the KXL got a ruling against it about the water crossings, that that judge has water living within his body, that those that are uh, defiling the medicine line up there between Canada and the United States, States and bringing pipelines across have water inside them too and that they are endangering all of life by going across that line with a pipeline. We need to understand activism right now. How do we enact it in this time of social media? I'm just learning how to do this thing right now and everyone's helping me. But it's connecting us with the divestment uh, group. It's connecting us with those that are saying we cannot allow Liberty Mutual to go ahead and continue to be the insurers of a pipeline that is destined to either help human beings become extinct or the fossil fuel companies becoming extinct because they're in a position now. We've got to recognize that in terms of their money, their ways, that they are paying more uh, in the retail fashion than they are wholesale. That's phenomenal. Places are shutting down that need to. Solar power, wind power, gardens, family first. Quit driving. Those are things that we have to be able to see work right now. That means they'll work in the future. Fasting so others can can have. Being thankful for all that is. And I want to do a huge shout out to those health workers that are there on the front lines, just like our people, all of us have frontline, fence line communities that are dealing with the extractive industry, which has made us so very, very vulnerable as indigenous people with diabetes, with asthma, with living in multi-generational homes, with having the very lowest health care, sometimes not even running water in our communities, and certainly not the infrastructure. And the federal government has fallen down on virtually every single promise that it ever made through treaties, through the uh, education, through health care, which is the ultimate and social uh, understanding that our people always had is we take care of each other. We love one another and we do for one another. And that is a primary example for all of us going forward, for all of our relations to know that we are connected in a very visceral way and that we love one another. And thank you, my mother, the earth. Thank you, my father, the sky. Thank you, all my relations in all directions. Sure. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate all these powerful words of wisdom, these calls to action. And uh, from all of us uh, at the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network and all of the women from their different organizations and places of work and tribal leadership, we thank you so much. and. Um, we wish you a powerful Earth Day now and an Earth Day every day. Thank you.